Hello, students. Welcome to the fifth video lecture for Healthcare Ethics, Fall 2020. This week, we are studying the concept of non-maleficence. The reading material that I have posted on Blackboard is an excerpt from a chapter that is appropriately titled Non-Maleficence, and it was written by Buchamp and Childress, who are among the most famous authors in the study of healthcare ethics. Um, and it was published in their big fat book, Principles of Biomedical Ethics, um, published by Oxford University Press in 2001. We are not reading the whole chapter. So it is a big long chapter. We are just reading pages 113 through 119. You will find them as you usually do in the course materials folder for this week. The reason I am telling you this is because it is different than what was originally written on our syllabus. So I don't know how many of you are referring to the syllabus as we go through, um, but the article that I had originally assigned on our syllabus seemed totally reasonable when I put it on the syllabus, uh, but then I reread it for class today and it, I realized that it's slightly crazy. Um, and I'm not sure it does a really good job of defining the concept of non-maleficence. So we are not reading it anymore. Um, that said, the chapter that I have given you is not an easy one. Okay. So that was why I had looked for something different, ended up putting that other thing on the syllabus that was a little crazy, but now you guys are reading this chapter by Buchamp and Childress, who are like the big dudes in the field of biomedical ethics. And their writing style is a little bit difficult to follow. Okay. So I shortened the reading. I gave you guys a pretty short excerpt from that chapter in hopes that you would try reading it twice because I'm gonna bet that it won't be the easiest thing to read in one go, okay? So I, I strongly recommend that you give yourself a lot of time on the reading this week and that you go through it more than once because it's not the easiest writing style to follow, okay? Um, also, this week's worksheet is a little bit different than normal, hopefully in a fun way. Um, so it asks you to draw a picture to represent uh, an idea from this week's reading. Um, so if you have some trouble with the logistics of drawing the picture and photographing it and getting it to me as part of the worksheet, send me an email, let me know, okay? Um, but uh, we're doing this because sometimes drawing a picture is a good way to practice and um, engage in different learning styles and it, um, studies have shown it can help you remember things better, okay? So uh, try drawing the picture, even if you don't like drawing, and I hope it's also a little bit fun. All right, so now that I've got us started, I'm going to begin today's lecture with a story. So it comes from Atul Gawande's 2002 book, Complications, A Surgeon's Notes on an Imperfect Science. So this is not a story that you read, but I'm going to read it to you because, um, yeah, well, you'll see. Um, this is the story that begins his book. Okay. I was once on trauma duty when a young man about 20 years old was rolled in, shot in the buttock. His pulse, blood pressure, and breathing were all normal. A clinical assistant cut the clothes off him with heavy shears, and I looked him over from head to toe, trying to be systematic but quick about it. I found the entrance, room in, en entrance wound in his right buttock cheek, a neat red half-inch hole, but I could find no exit wound. No other injuries were evident. He was alert and scared, more afraid of us than the bullet. I'm fine, he insisted, I'm fine. But on the rectal exam, my gloved finger came back coated with fresh blood. And when I threaded a urinary catheter into the 
bright red blood flowed from his bladder, too. The conclusion was obvious. The blood meant that the, bla that the bullet had gone inside him. Both through his rectum and his bladder, I told him. Major blood vessels, his kidneys, other sections of bowel may have been hit as well. He needed surgery, I said, and we had to go now. He saw the look in my eyes, the nurses already packing him up to move, and he nodded, almost involuntarily, putting himself in our hands. Then the gurney wheels were whizzing, ivy bags swing swinging, people holding doors open for us to pass through. In the operating room, the anesthesiologist put him under. We made a fast, deep slash down the middle of his abdomen, from his rib cage to his pubis. We grabbed retractors and pulled him open, and what we found inside was nothing. No blood, no hole in the bladder, no hole in the rectum, no bullet. We peeked under the drapes at the urine coming out of the catheter. It was normal now, clear yellow. It didn't even have a tinge of blood. We had an x-ray machine brought into the room and got x-rays of his pelvis, his abdomen, and also his chest. They showed no bullet anymore. All of this was odd, to say the least. After almost an hour or more of fruitless searching, however, there seemed nothing to do but sew him up. A couple of days later, we got another abdominal x-ray. This one revealed a bullet lodged inside the right upper quadrant of his abdomen. We had no explanation for any of this, how a half-inch long lead bullet had gotten from his buttock to his upper belly without injuring anything, why it hadn't appeared on the previous x-rays, or where the blood we had seen had come from. Having already done more harm than the bullet had, however, we finally left it and the young man alone. We kept him in the hospital for a week. Except for our gash, he turned out fine. So I read this story to you because the author that we didn't read for today, whose name is Nathan Carlin, gave it as an example, and I thought it was a pretty good one. So what he says about it is... In this case, the patient was harmed by the surgery that was inflicted upon him, and it seems as though he would have been better off if he had been left alone. Still, Gawande and his team did the right thing, because there, it was very likely that the young man was bleeding internally from a gunshot wound. It's hard to imagine any surgeon making a different choice than the one Gawande did. But the decision to do nothing further other than a week of observation, was grounded in non-maleficence. So the story that I read gives us two concepts for approaching the article that we read this week by Buchamp and Childress. And those two concepts are non-maleficence, the key concept for this week, and harm. So if the first decision that Gawande and his team made to operate on this patient who presented with a bullet wound is a reasonable error, the second decision of the healthcare team not to act, to do no further operations, is an action of non-maleficence. Gawande says... Having already done more harm than the bullet had, however, we finally left it and the young man alone. What's important here is that non-maleficence is about not doing things, specifically not doing things that cause or might cause harm. Okay, so let's talk about that essay, the chapter by Buchamp and Childress, titled Non-Maleficence. So if you guys look at the beginning of the essay, um, so 
Sorry, before we get to the beginning of the essay, I wanted to tell you guys that these guys, <laughs> Beauchamp and Childress, invented the concept of principalism. So I know that's one of the key words that we've been studying in this class, and the four principles that go with it, um, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, these guys, Beauchamp and Childress, they're the ones who came up with that, okay? So they literally wrote the book on it, and now you are reading it. This is the book, okay? Um, so they're a big deal, um, and that means that we're not necessarily their target audience, okay? Um, so, in the opening pages of the article, Beauchamp and Childress are arguing, quibbling even, with a guy called William Frankina. So they're not really speaking to us, they're speaking in this chapter to other philosophers and bioethicists like Frankina, which is part of why it's actually pretty hard to read. So when you're reading this, put on your philosopher hat, okay? And imagine that you are not a clinician, you're not someone who's practicing, um, and you're not a student, but you're a full-blown academic philosopher, okay? Um, so, um, Buchamp and Childress define the principle of non-maleficence as something that obliges us to abstain from causing harm to others. As we have been saying in our uh, in my fondness for definitions, um, non maleficence comes from the Latin roots non male and ficere. So it's about not doing bad. Bad here is defined as harm. Um, so Buchamp and Childress rather obnoxiously point out in the very opening pages that the oft-quoted maxim, first do no harm, which was quoted, for example, by Yeo and Morehouse in the article we read for last week, um, Buchamp and Childress want to make sure we know that that's not actually in the Hippocratic Oath, okay? But the Hippocratic Oath does say some other things about obligations to beneficence and non-maleficence. Um, their point is a rather useless one here, um, but if you can remember non-maleficence as do no harm, you're off to a good start, okay? Um, so after they tell us that non-maleficence is, or that do no harm is not really in the Hippocratic Oath, they engage in this quibble with William Frankena. Um, and that's where they're, they're you know, listing on, um, a bunch of prohibitions and rules, and they're, they're trying to um, argue about what might be underlying this concept of non-maleficence. And the important thing that I want you guys to get out of this is that they want to establish a distinction between non-maleficence and beneficence. So this is a thing you guys are gonna need to know for your worksheet this week. So they write on page 114, obligations to not harm others, in, exam as it, in example, those prohibiting theft, disablement, and killing. So obligations not to harm others are distinct from obligations to help others. For example, those prescribing the provision of benefits, protection of interests, and the promotion of welfare. Okay, so what they're saying is obligations, rules, ethical rules that tell us we can't harm others, we can't steal things or hurt people or kill people are different from the ethical rules that demand that we help others. Those prescribing, those insisting that we have obligations to give people things or protect people or help people, right? They want to say that 
non-maleficence obligations not to harm is are dis, is distinct from as a philosophical rule beneficence obligations to help okay um so that's why they end up revising Frankena's list right so his original list shows up on 114 and he lists these things that sound pretty good and they sound pretty related one ought not to inflict evil or harm. One ought to prevent evil or harm. One ought to remove evil or harm. And one ought to do or promote good. And what Buchamp and Childress do here is they group those on page 115 under two separate headings. The first one, one ought not to inflict evil or harm, goes under non-maleficence, and all the rest of them go under beneficence. What they're doing here is grouping some basic ethical pro propositions under different headings so that they don't have to put them in an order of priority like their, um, like this Frankena guy does, so that they don't have to say one of these is more important than the other. And this is kind of what their theory of principalism does in general. So it doesn't say autonomy is more important than beneficence or that non-maleficence is more important than justice, but it just kind of separates out ethical ideas into different categories that might function simultaneously. Okay, so why did they group them this way on this list? Why is non-maleficence... Um, one ought not to inflict evil or harm, and beneficence, all the other three. One ought to prevent evil or harm, one ought to remove evil or harm, and one ought to do or promote good. So the answer that they give on page 115, right below that list, is that each of the three forms of beneficence, those last three, requires taking action by helping preventing harm, removing harm, and promoting good. So there's action involved in all of the beneficence ones. Whereas non-maleficence only requires intentionally refraining from actions that cause harm. So non-maleficence is about intent, but intentionally refraining, refraining, so not doing, right? It's not about doing things in the world. Non-maleficence is about prohibitions. So they say, shortly after, rules of non-maleficence, therefore, take the form, do not do X. Pretty simple. Um, autonomy shows up again here, as you know, we might expect. So they say um, that some philosophers say, do not interfere with a person's autonomous choices as the baseline definition of autonomy, right? So you don't have to worry about their quibble with these other philosophers, but it's important to note that you can imagine a connection between non-maleficence and autonomy here, right? So there is a non-maleficent obligation not to interfere with autonomy. Um, and the, the formula do not interfere with a person's autonomous choices, do not do X, Y, or Z, might actually sound familiar to those of you who grew up with uh, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, right? So those um, people who are, who are raised Christian or Jewish or Muslim might have encountered the Ten Commandments in their life, um, in which uh, we get a lot of propositions that take this form, right? Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not cover the, covet thy neighbor's wife, etc. Right? So in this context, the rule of non-maleficence in healthcare ethics is thou shalt not harm patients. Okay, so we're going to leave aside the um, religious connotations and just try to stick with the rule um, and ask... In this rule, one of the key terms, what is harm? So if thou shalt not harm patients, 
What does it mean to harm someone? So we got an example about harm in the story that I began with. And Buchamp and Childress are also really interested in defining harm, and they've got a whole section on it, right? So in that section, they go to a lot of trouble to establish a distinction between harming and wronging, only to say, okay, we're just talking about harming. So you don't have to worry too much about the distinction that they're making there between harming and wronging, or the other distinctions that go with it between harm and injury, or between normative versus non-normative definitions of harm. All they're going on about is the idea that some people think harming involves questions of justice, and they can't really handle questions of justice. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I'm going to give you Carlin's paraphrase of this because he's actually pretty clear about it. Um, so this is a paraphrase of that whole section under the heading, The Concept of Harm, on pages 116 through 117. But this is not, so this is not Buchamp and Childress, this is this other guy who you guys didn't read. Um, but he, he clarifies things pretty clearly. So I'm going to read his paraphrase aloud for you. Buchamp and Childress note a distinction between harming and wronging, in that one can be harmed without being wronged and vice versa. For example, one can be physically harmed from a hurricane but not morally wronged, or a patient can be wronged by an insurance company if the insurance company denies a legitimate claim for which the hospital assumes the cost. That is, being wronged without being harmed. So harm here, this is my paraphrase, not his, harm refers to material or physical losses, right? Like your roof blew off in a hurricane, that's a pretty clear harm. A harm can also be, but you, if, you're, if your roof blew off in a hurricane, you're not wronged because there isn't really anyone to blame. You can also be wronged without being harmed. So if the insurance company denies your claim and you, you're like, hey, uh, you said you would pay for my medications and you didn't. It's like clearly wrong. They're doing the wrong thing. It's, un like, it's not just. But if the hospital pays for it, you're probably like, eh, fine, whatever, right? You're not, you're not harmed. So harm is about the things that affect you, that injure you, that make your life difficult, whether they're material or physical right? It can also refer to the kind of harm that happened to the patient in Atul Gawande's story when they performed an unnecessary surgery on him, right? Okay, so harms are things that hurt, um, whether metaphorically or physically. So um, what I just read for you, what this other author wrote, what he was doing was a paraphrase, which is a thing I often ask you to do on your assignments, okay? So I'm, I'm actually going to read it again. I know it's kind of boring, but I want you to listen to it, not this time for what it says, but for what it's doing as an example of a paraphrase of another text, okay? So take, take a moment, open up your Buchamp and Childress article, and look at the section under the concept of harm on pages 116 through 117. It's a pretty dense section. There's a lot going on there, right? And this guy compressed it into three sentences. And that's the kind of thing that you guys are trying to learn how to do to pull information out and, and explain it in your own words um, and condense it in a way. So digest it, right? So that's what this guy does in his paraphrase. Okay, so you 
take a look at Buchamp and Childress, 116 through 117, and I'm going to read this paraphrase of it. So Buchamp and Childress note a distinction between harming and wronging, in that one can be harmed without being wronged, and vice versa. For example, one can be physically harmed from a hurricane, but not morally wronged. Or a patient can be wronged by an insurance company if the insurance company denies a legitimate claim for which the hospital assumes the cost, that is, being wronged without being harmed. So see how he uses a couple of examples there to clarify his points? And he gets their general aim of the distinction between harm and wrong. So he pulls out what he thinks is interesting about this and knits it together with some clear examples. That's the kind of writing that I want you guys to do. Okay. And the other, so the other thing you're going to do on your worksheet this week is practice giving examples. Okay. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading that. All right. So now away from our question of form, back to the content. Um, so basically, the only thing that you guys need to worry about from this is that Buchamp and Childress are not interested in wrong. They're not interested in being um, harmed in a manner of justice, but they're interested in harm. So that, yeah, so they're not interested in moral claims having to do with justice. They're interested in harm as in ethical claims that have to do with injury, pain, loss. They define harm on page 116 as thwarting, defeating, or setting back some party's interests. In the, its broadest sense, they say on 117, the term harm seems to embrace almost every condition that might restrict autonomous action, such as causing discomfort, humiliation, offense, and annoyance. So if you have your critical reading hat on, you can tell that they're belittling this definition. The people that are want to see the term of harm as so large that it includes discomfort, humiliation, offense, and annoyance. But Note the way they use autonomy there. Autonomy, it's one of our key terms and it's one of their key terms, right? They're the guys who invented this. Harm, at the core of this statement, harm is something that restricts autonomous action. Okay, the term harm seems to embrace almost every condition that might restrict autonomous action. So that's another way you guys can think of defining harm when you're trying to connect these concepts. Um, but Buchamp and Childress, having, having given us that definition, tell us they don't want to concentrate on the small stuff. They're not interested in discomfort, humiliation, offense, and annoyance. What they're going for, what they're going to concentrate on, are the physical harms. Uh, they say on 117, physical harms, especially pain, disability, and death. Okay, so then, based on that interest, we get another list. This time, a list of specific prohibitions that come from the principle of non-maleficence. And this shows up on the bottom of 117. And again, it looks, um, back to our idea of the Ten Commandments, it looks uh, like, it's, like it's actually pretty rooted in those, in those kind of faith traditions. Um, so... Yeah, we might, we might be interested in questioning that, but um, for right now, I'm just going to read you the list. So bottom of 117, they say, do not kill, do not cause pain or suffering, do not incapacitate, do not cause offense, and do not deprive others of the goods of life. So you guys will note what it says underneath it's kind of interesting and maybe a bit perplexing. These moral rules, do not kill, do not cause pain or suffering, etc., are prima facie, <laughs> not absolute, okay? Prima facie means 
accepted as correct until proven otherwise. So, an absolute rule would be one that holds true in every circumstance, no matter what. But a prima facie rule is one that is held true until proven otherwise. That means that you're going to start out with it being true, but if you encounter an obstacle, it might not end up being, being true anymore. So take, for example, the second rule on that list they gave us. Do not cause pain or suffering. And think for a minute about chemotherapy. So if it's a rule that we get from the principle of non-maleficence that one should not cause pain or suffering, what does it mean that doctors prescribe chemotherapy all the time? Chemotherapy is a classic example of a treatment that causes a lot of pain and suffering. So much pain and suffering that patients sometimes die from the treatment rather than the disease. But still, we give it. Why? Because we understand the good of treating cancer, the benefit of treating cancer, to outweigh the pain and suffering of chemotherapy. So the rule, do not cause pain or suffering, is operative until it encounters something bigger. So this is connected to the distinction between beneficence and non-maleficence. So it seems like non-maleficence ought to come first, right? Like the rule that thou shalt not kill should always come before the obligation to treat. But in practice, you can't always say that non-maleficence is more important than beneficence. It's, it's more of a sliding scale. So Buchamp and Childress write on page 114, in general... If, in a particular case, the injury inflicted is very minor, say, swelling from a needle stick, but the benefit provided by rescue is major, such as a life-saving intervention, then we tend to think that the obligation of beneficence takes priority over the obligation of non-maleficence. So, in a situation where the injury inflicted is very minor, but the benefit provided is major, then we tend to go for beneficence. We think it's more important. You can cause a little bit of harm in order to do good. The, the obligation of beneficence takes priority over the obligation of non-maleficence. But in situations where the harm inflicted is a bit bigger, like in chemotherapy, for example, and the benefit a bit smaller or more uncertain, like a fractionally decreased risk of death, like you might not die this month, as opposed to a very clear-cut life-saving intervention, then balancing between non-maleficence and beneficence is a lot more difficult. So... This is where we start talking about quality of life concerns, um, which is something we'll address a little bit next week, hopefully. But the idea here is that just like in informed consent, where the patient needs to weigh the benefits against the risks, in this case, the provider has to weigh their duty to beneficence, the good that you as the provider might be able to produce for the patient has to be weighed against your duty to non-maleficence, your duty to not harm the patient. Okay, so now we've made it to the second story. Okay, so I'm going to read us um, the second story from the introduction of Atul Gawande's book. Recently, he writes, a boy was flown in by helicopter to one of the hospitals where I work as a resident. Lee Tran, as we can call him, 
was a small, spiky-haired kid barely out of elementary school. He had always been healthy, but for the previous week, his mother had noticed he had a dry, persistent cough and seemed less energetic than usual. For the last couple days, he'd hardly eaten. She thought it was probably a flu. That evening, however, he came to her pale, tremulous, and wheezing, suddenly unable to catch his breath. At a local emergency room, doctors gave him vaporized breathing treatments, thinking he was having an asthma attack. But then an x-ray revealed an immense mass filling the middle of his chest. They got a CT scan for a more detailed picture. In stark black and white, it showed the mass to be a dense, almost football-sized tumor enveloping the vessels of his heart, pushing the heart itself to one side and compressing the airway to both lungs. The tumor had already completely crushed the passage to his right lung, and without air coming through, the lung had collapsed to a gray nubbin on the scan. A sea of fluid from the tumor occupied his right chest instead. Lee was living entirely off his left lung, and the tumor was pressing down on the airway to it too. The community hospital he was in did not have the resources to deal with this, so the doctor sent him to us. We had the specialists and the high-tech equipment, but that didn't mean we were sure what to do. By the time Lee arrived in our intensive care unit, his breathing was a buzzing, reedy streeter. You could hear it three beds away. The scientific literature is unequivocal about this situation. It is deadly dangerous. Just laying him down could cause the tumor to cut off the remainder of his airway. Giving him sedatives or anesthesia could do the same. Surgery to remove the tumor is impossible. Chemotherapy, however, is known to shrink some of these tumors over the course of few, a few days. The question was how to buy the child time to find out. It wasn't, it wasn't clear he'd last the night. We had two nurses, an anesthesiologist, a pediatric surgery junior fellow, and three residents at his bedside, myself included. The senior pediatric surgeon was on his cell phone, driving in from home, an oncologist was on page. One nurse propped Lee up on pillows to make sure he was as upright as he could be. Another put an oxygen mask on his face and hooked up monitors tracking his vital signs. The boy's eyes were wide and worried, and his breathing was about twice too fast. His family was still far away, having to travel by ground. But he remained sweetly brave, as children do more often than you'd expect. My first instinct was that the anesthesiologist should put a stiff breathing tube into the boy's airway to fix it open before the tumor closed in but the anesthesiologist thought this was nuts. She'd have to put the tube in without good sedation with the kid sitting up, no less. And the tumor extended far along the airway. She wasn't convinced she could reach a tube past it easily enough. The surgical ch fellow proposed another idea. If we put a catheter into the boy's right chest and drained off the fluid filling it, the tumor would tilt away from the left lung. On the phone, however, the senior surgeon was concerned that this could worsen matters. Once you have unsettled a boulder, can you honestly say which way it will roll? No one was thinking of any better options, however, so ultimately he got to go ahead. I explained to Lee what we were going to do as simply as I could. I doubt he understood. That may have been just as well. After we'd gathered all the supplies we needed, two of us held Lee tight, and another injected a local anesthetic between his ribs, then made a slit with a knife and pushed a foot and a half long rubber catheter in. Bloody fluid poured out the tube by the court, and for a moment I was afraid we'd done something terrible. But as it turned out, we'd done more good than we could have hoped for. The tumor shifted rightwards, and somehow 
the airway to both lungs opened up. Instantly, Li's breathing became easier and quiet. After watching him a few minutes, so did ours. Not until later did I wonder about our choice. It was little more than a guess about what to do, a stab in the dark, almost literally. We had no backup plan should disaster have occurred. And when I looked up reports of similar cases in the library afterward, I learned that other options did, in fact, exist. The safest thing, apparently, would have been to put him on a heart-lung bypass pump, like the kind used during cardiac surgery, or at least to have one on standby. Talking with the others about it, though, I found that no one regretted a thing. Lee survived. That was what mattered. So I want you guys to think of this story as an example of negligence. Not gross negligence, not even something necessarily legally negligent, but still an example of negligence in healthcare. There was a safer option, and they didn't do it because they didn't know about it. They lacked the knowledge. Gawande said, we had no backup plan should disaster have occurred. The fact that disaster didn't occur means that this is an example of negligence without harm. The important thing I want you guys to take away from this story is that negligence is about creating the risk of harm not necessarily the harm itself. So you usually only get in trouble for being negligent if the harm materializes, if things do go bad. But as a concept, negligence is not about the harm. It's only about creating a possibility for harm. And in this story, they definitely created a possibility for harm. That shit could have gone really bad, but it didn't. That doesn't mean, though, that it wasn't negligence. They got lucky. Okay, so Buchamp and Childress, in their definition of negligence, relate it to non-maleficence. So on page 117, they write, Obligations of non-maleficence are not only obligations of not inflicting harms, but also include obligations of not imposing risks of harm. So negligence is part of non-maleficence. It's the part that deals with the risks of harm rather than the harm itself. They actually give a really nice, clear definition of negligence on page 150. 118. They write, negligence is the absence of due care. Negligence in their understanding covers two types of situations. The first is intentionally posing risks of harm that are unreasonable, which they further describe as an agent knowingly imposes an unwarranted risk. So a risk that didn't need to happen Uh, but somebody makes it happen and they know that they're making it happen. Or someone can unintentionally but carelessly impose risks of harm, which they describe as an agent unknowingly performs a harmful act that he or she should have avoided. So you guys might note if you're looking at page 118 that their examples are kind of terrible. So um, they're very strongly hierarchical. Um, Surprise, a nurse messes things up because she's lazy and a doctor fails to respect patient confidentiality, but it's okay because the doctor just forgot. Um, So like their earlier example of harm without intent on pages 117 through 118, um, it it reveals a fairly strong political conservatism in their writing. Um, So... The example of elevated cancer rates at a chemical plant 
being a situation where harms are caused without intent um, works to resolve capitalism of responsibility. Not great. Anyways, um, the, I would argue that the an issue of intentionality is not really what matters here. What matters is a situation occurs in which there are risks, risks of harm. In this case, risks of harm caused to the patient by the absence of due care. So the definition that I want you guys to focus on is the um, nice, succinct little definition they give on 118, that negligence is the absence of due care. And what is due care? Due care involves a fiduciary relationship, a thing we have been studying already. So here it appears with, in terms of a professional duty. So they give you a nice list on page 118 through 119 that connects this idea of due care to the idea of a fiduciary relationship, even though they don't use that word. So the, they list uh, first that the professional must have a duty to the affected party. Second, the professional must breach that duty. And third, the afflicted party must experience a harm. And fourth, the harm must be caused by a breach of duty. So this is the, uh, their definition of a failure of due care, right? So I guess they would disagree with me that um, negligence might involve a situation where the harm does not occur. Um, nonetheless, um, the idea is that providers have a duty to the affected party, to their patients, right? And that um, an absence of due care is a failure in terms of that duty. So we talked a bit about that, that very same duty last week when we were discussing duty versus desire in the concept of beneficence. Um, and so we're dealing with basically the same deal here. Healthcare providers have a professional responsibility to care for their patients. You will note that the, they use the term, um, the standards of care, your champ and childress do. It shows up in the next paragraph. They write, these standards require proper training, skills, and diligence. So you can connect this back as well to the Beneficence article we read last week and the discussion of a caring relationship by Yeo and Morehouse. So the distinction between good intentions and good outcomes is governed by this caring relationship. Here, defined as standards of care. So the standards that Buchamp and Childress are talking about in their discussion of due care involve the same knowledge and skills that are needed to produce outcomes in the Yale and Morehouse Beneficence article that we read for last week. Okay, so uh, we've almost made it to the end. Um, don't worry too much about the legal language in that block quote. Um, on the last page of what I asked you guys to read, but do try to read it. It might actually prove easier to read than the, than the language around it. Um, the important part of what um, the legal language is trying to convey there is that the courts hold providers to a standard of ordinary skill and that they recognize that medicine is imperfect. So negligence doesn't mean that you, ha the idea of negligence doesn't mean that as a healthcare provider, you have to be perfect all the time. Otherwise you'll be seen as negligent. So the courts recognize that medicine is imperfect. Um, and this brings us back to our friend Atul Gawande, whose book after all is called Complications. So he writes, we look for medicine to be an orderly field of knowledge and procedure, but it is not. It is an imperfect science, an un enterprise of constantly changing knowledge, uncertain information, fallible individuals, and at the same time, lives on the line. There is science in what we do, yes, but also habit, intuition, and 
and sometimes plain old guessing. The gap between what we know and what we aim for persists, and this gap complicates everything we do. Okay, so that's it for this week. Um, I look forward to receiving your projects soon, and um, don't hesitate to email if you have any questions. Okay, take care.